About two years ago, I went through a divorce from my wife. When we first got married, we had high hopes for a long and happy marriage. At the time, I was head over heels in love with her, and it seemed like she loved me just as much. But as the years went by, things began to change. I would rush home from work, looking forward to my wife's embrace, and she? Well, things were different. It was like the anecdote. Husband returns from a business trip, and you can guess the rest. I found her with another man in our bed. I didn't ask who he was, I just knew I couldn't stand his presence. I quickly escorted him out, leaving him to climb the stairs, half-dressed and concerned about being seen by the nosy neighbors. When my heart had calmed and I regained my composure, I asked my wife if she wanted to stay in the apartment or move in with her parents. We were renting a two-bedroom on the outskirts of town, so there wasn't much to share. She just shrugged her shoulders and nonchalantly said, Why should we move? What's done is done. Her apparent indifference infuriated me. Gritting my teeth, I stated, You have ten minutes to leave my house. I remember struggling to remove my wedding ring, fighting the urge to forcefully kick my once beloved wife out of our shared space. She shrugged again, retreated to the bedroom, and turned on some music. At that moment, I couldn't help but think, what a heartless woman. Who does she think she is? Fueled by anger, I headed for the kitchen, remembering the expensive bottle of cognac I had gotten for my birthday at work. It was still in the cupboard. A few minutes later, Mia appeared, standing on the threshold of the kitchen. Can I have a drink too? Sent the wife your back a bit early, she said carelessly. I wanted to surprise you. I replied, looking directly at my wife. As you can see, I succeeded. That's for sure. Anya grinned. If you don't calm down by morning, I'll leave. Life with you is no gift, sweetheart. You don't notice anything around you, and I've been bored with you for a long time. I listened to these revelations, barely holding back tears. What a fool I was. After finishing my drink, I went to the living room, telling her on the way, I'll leave for the night, and tomorrow I'll call you to pack your things. I spent the night at my friend's house. We drank and talked about conniving women, remembering my naive illusions about them. Ralph, by the way, was also divorced, but his wife had left him for a reason. In fact, for the same surprise Mia had given me. After a few drinks, Ralph casually said, She was hitting on me too, when you got drunk and fell asleep. Remember New Year's Eve at the dacha? But I'm not a jerk. Maybe I'm not a saint. But being with a friend's wife is out of the question. I turned her down, and I think she's hated me ever since. Well, I don't care. I said drunkenly. Thank goodness everything is out in the open now. Otherwise I'd be living like a fool. It's a good thing we don't have children. Let her go her own way, as long as she stays out of my sight. Still, I should have beaten that man's face in, shouldn't I? But Ralph was asleep, and I had no one to complain to about life. In the morning, I came home before work. Only bare walls and a hungry cat were waiting for me. Wow, she took everything. Well, I don't care, I'm not attached to material possessions. I regret the years I spent with her. A week later, she called. Hi, I miss you so much. Her voice was still charming, but for some reason it made me sick. Can we start over? She asked. No thanks, I replied, shuddering in disgust. And don't call again. Really? Mia was furious. You'll regret it. A month after I finalized my divorce, something unusual started happening to me. I constantly felt like I was being watched, or rather, that there was always someone around. Of course, I did not see any devils with who's and tails, but I had an undeniable feeling that even when my apartment was empty, I was not alone. Once, while at work, I had to climb up a nine-story building because the construction workers needed to repair the roof. Talking to the contractor, I involuntarily approached the edge and suddenly felt a light push in my back. I recoiled from the surprise and almost fell. Filled with anger, I turned around to reprimand the guilty joker, but to my surprise, there was no one in sight. My workers looked at me in utter confusion, asking why I was acting this way. I wiped the sweat from my forehead and mumbled a weak excuse, citing dizziness. My deputy worriedly patted me on the back, 
suggested it might be a blood pressure problem, advised me to see a doctor, and emphasized the potential danger. That day stayed with me for the rest of my life, every minute etched in my memory. Several more times I found myself on the brink of death. I would narrowly avoided being hit by a truck, nearly fell victim to an approaching car, and nearly collided with a brick thrown by a late-night junkie into the entryway of my own home. That I was able to avoid these dangers was a true miracle. Fortunately, my combat training from hand-to-hand -hand combat and airborne training proved useful. I quickly apprehended the assailant, who turned out to be a known neighborhood bad guy with a tattoo of a Varanus on his left forearm. The arriving police officers expressed their gratitude by shaking my hand, though I, preoccupied with sensing a lurking demon, paid no attention to their appreciation. The sleepless night had not been in vain. The next morning, on my way to work, I turned the wheel clumsily and drifted into the oncoming lane. Fortunately, my quick reflexes avoided a head-on collision with a van. Thankfully, the damage was limited to a scratched door and a dented bumper. And I didn't argue with the driver, who almost resorted to a physical confrontation, accusing me of provoking a dangerous situation. He was right, at least in part. In that moment, it was finally clear to me that my ex-wife's threats were not empty words. She was the one behind the push from the roof, the one who had instigated the attack by the stone teenager, and the one who had controlled the steering wheel, directing me to collide with the oncoming car. It was clear that it wasn't just her physical presence, but her will, her desire to destroy me, and her hatred. Two years had passed since our divorce, and my ex-wife had remarried, seemingly thriving in her life with the son of a local tycoon. However, I still felt an undercurrent of ill will in my existence, constantly, or only once every six months. I found myself in unusual and dangerous situations. There was a feeling that these events were being set up by someone. Perhaps I was just suffering from hallucinations, but on the other hand, it was better to know that the enemy was not slumbering. 